Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to bring out our first two competitors of the day. Starting with the American player, the Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica champion. Join me in welcoming Andrew Ellen Bogan. He claims to be a burger connoisseur and is also one of the top magic players out there. He's gonna be rocking a little Esper Control and some Gruel Warriors for you today. His opponent, you may have seen his stream, which is online all the time. He is from the Netherlands. Let's welcome Tice Molendijk. Now this is Tice's first ever competitive Magic player, but with his experience playing in front of a crowd, no doubt Tice is gonna do oh so well. Let's get the first match underway. First matchup, we've got Esper Control versus White Weenies. Paul, who do you think is favored in this matchup? Um, one of the most important things in this format, of course, is the die roll. And I think this matchup is extremely close. Now, uh, the, the, there are certain keys to the white deck that you basically need to accomplish to be able to win this matchup. Yeah. First is, hope your opponent doesn't have one of their sweepers in their hand, right? <laughs> of course, the Esper Control deck has access to lots of sweepers. You have cards like Cry of the Carnarium, Kaya's Wrath, effects like that that basically make it so that, you know, all the pressure that the white aggressive deck wants to put onto the board gets eliminated with one card. However, the white aggressive decks, or many of the white aggressive decks that I saw submitted going into this tournament, do play a, a few copies of Unbreakable Formation. Sure. Unbreakable Formation is an extremely important card uh, against this control deck because it allows you to invalidate Kaya's Wrath as a way to kind of sweep the board. So it gives you a little bit of that protection. Another key in the matchup is, for example, uh, the, the number one thing is to get to a fast start, but on top of that, things like flipping Allegiance Landing mm. make it so that that gives you additional pressure when your opponents do, are in fact able to sweep the board, and a flip Allegiance Landing by itself can just end up winning the game. Definitely, definitely. So uh, we do see the opening hand here for Tyus. Um, yeah. What do you think of this one so far? Well, it has only one land, so I imagine that they're going to be mulliganing that. But I, I just want to talk about Some of the kind, key cards of, kind of the keys on the other side yeah. of, the, uh, of the board. Part of what the Esper Control deck is looking to do is control the early game with a combination of disruption in the form of removal and hand disruption and counter magic, mm -hmm. and then ultimately take over the game with ca uh, card advantage cards like Chemistry Insight mm -hmm. and Teferi Hero of Dominaria. All right, so here we can see Andrew Ellen Bogan, and he started playing Magic in 2001. Um, he's played five Mythic Championships so far. Mythic Champions, of course, now what the Pro Tour used to be called. Um, and he is the PT Guild of Ravnica champion. Tyson, on the other hand, started playing in Magic 2018. He has reached gold in Arena and, of course, is a newcomer to the Mythic Championships. So he's uh, looking to, uh, to put his mark on this tournament. Yeah, however, Tyson is no stranger to high-level competitive play, one of the one of the top Hearthstone pros uh, w when he was playing, and there's a lot of skills that transfer between the two games. Now, taking a look at Andrew Ellenbogen's list here, uh, again, this is kind of a, a fairly stock Esper control list that you would expect. As you can see, you have the cheap interaction. You have the cheap interactive removal in cards like Moment of Craving Cast Down. You have the sweepers, and then, of course, the primary win condition, four copies of Teferi Hero of Dominaria, and one spicy little com uh, mm -hmm. copy of Kaya to uh, kind of close out games. All right, this is Andrew's other deck, and it is Gruel Warriors. So this deck focusing on a whole bunch of big guys going real fast. Right, and this is <laughs> what's really interesting about that deck is it is a monocolor deck, and as you can see, you can see Andrew's sideboard here, and you might be asking, yo, hey, this is best of one. Why is there a sideboard? Why are there sideboards here? Well, <laughs> many of the control decks in the format are playing a card called Mastermind's Acquisition, and Mastermind's Acquisition allows you to cast a spell and search your sideboard for a specific card to put into your hand. So because of that, any deck that's capable of casting Mastermind's Acquisition by stealing the spell also should be submitting a 15-card sideboard. So, in this case, Andrew Allenbogen has, is playing copies of Dire Fleet Daredevil that can potentially steal a Mastermind's acquisition that, acquisition that has already been cast from your opponent's right. graveyard. 
Looking at Tice's list here, it is a mono white weenie deck. And uh, what do you think? The, what are the key cards in this? Well, basically, the important thing for the white weenie deck is it's extremely consistent. It wants to flood the board with a bunch of cheap creatures and then also take advantage of the convoke mechanic, which then allows you to play multiple spells in one turn. All right. So we are ready to get going. The players look like they are prepared for battle. So let's head straight into the action, friends. Here we go. Very first round of the Mythic Invitational here at PAX East. Let's get right into it. So taking a look here at Tice's hand, it looks like he did keep. Tice opted to keep the one lander, he yeah. He did keep the one lander, so hoping for an extra land on top. Now, you know, th this is the classic case. I've also done this myself where you're oh, like, yeah, you I've know what? <laughs> Maybe I'm going to get try to get a little bit lucky here yeah. and string together a couple lands. Because if, if he does manage to string together a few lands in a row, I mean, this is kind of the ideal start. You have cheap creatures, history of Benalia, and Venerator Locks. But he doesn't find that second land. He doesn't find the second land, but he could possibly get three bodies on the board to get a third or second source of land from Leech's landing flip. But looking at um, Andrew Ellenbogen's hand, there's a whole bunch of nope in there, so creatures are going to die. Right, absolutely. So taking a look at Andrew Ellenbogen's hand here, he's got the turn one watery grave with the isolated chapel and the drowned catacomb. And he even has the cheap interactive removal. So now Andrew has the decision here of whether or not he wants to play a thought erasure to look at Tice's hand. But again, keep in mind, Tice missed a land drop. So it might actually be in his best interest to fire off that moment of craving instead and just try to preserve his life total. Mm. Had he not drawn land number three this turn, I could have seen Andrew choose to play Thought Erasure instead because it has Surveil 1, which then allows you to kind of manipulate your draws to make sure you find your land drops. Definitely. So passing the turn three, still no land for Tice. Might be getting a little desperate here, but uh, I think we'll go in for a swing anyway. Uh, Andrew does have the mana up available for Moments of Craving, and we'll see it cost here. Dispatching of the Dauntless Bodyguard. Yeah, so choosing to use it on the, mo uh, the Dauntless Bodyguard. Now, Tice can actually sacrifice the Dauntless Bodyguard in response to the Moment of Craving to prevent the life gain yeah. uh, from that card, but it doesn't look like he chose to do that. And again, Tice, you can see a little bit of that frustration not finding the additional mana sources here to kind of play all those cards in. And this plays exactly into the game plan of the Esper Control deck. If you're just going to be playing out one threat a turn, the Esper deck can handle that. It's when the white deck plays multiple threats in one turn, followed by a gigantic venerated Loxodon, <laughs> when things kind of get out of hand. Yeah. So now taking a peek into Tice's hand, what do you think he's getting rid of here? Uh, I think History of Banalia is one of the most likely cards for Andrew to go after because it presents multiple threats in one turn. Now, there's a lot of one-for-one -one removal, but in order for Andrew to be able to deal with multiple threats, he's going to need to be able to cast a Sweeper. But it looks like he actually just chose to go with the one drop here instead. Yeah, he's seeing that uh, Tice is a little mana starved. Oh, and this so is going to be brutal. This is going to be a savage turn from oh, Andrew Ellenbogen. He drew dear. one of his two copies of Cry of the Carnarium, which gives minus two, minus two to all the creatures and also exiles them, meaning oh, no. that Haunted Witness will not create a 1-1 one, one token. There goes the board. All right, so Andrew is uh, firmly in control of this matchup. Still no land for Tice. He really needs to find another source of mana. He needs to get these three drops on the board. But Andrew is just applying the pressure, thought erasing whatever he can get. Yeah, this is exactly what you want from the Esper Control deck. Andrew's sitting at a pretty 17 life. And it's like turn three or four of the game, so he's looking really, really good. And keep in mind, Tice, he just got three for one in that previous turn. And at this point, you know, all Andrew needs to do is just try to string together lands so he can slam that Teferi Hero of Dominaria onto the battlefield and basically just kind of take over the game with that card. And at the moment, there's no real pressure for Andrew to mortify Legion's landing, which is a big threat. But at the moment, he's just making sure nothing sticks on the board. He's yeah, Stubborn Sentry. You might be asking, why am I playing a one mana zero three creature in my deck? <laughs> well, it does have the ascend mechanic attached to it. If you control 10 or more permanents, it will become a one mana three three, which is really, really good value. However, yeah. Tice is very far away from 10 permanents. All right. What does he do here? He can just keep dropping one ones on the board, but I just have a feeling that uh, Andrew's just going to keep dispatching of them. Right. Which is 
yeah, unfortunate for, uh, for Tice. Yeah, the white aggressive deck is only really good at doing one thing, mm. playing one drops and attacking. So yeah. that's, that's what he's gonna continue to, and again, Tice does not sacrifice the Dauntless Bodyguard. He could have sacrificed the Dauntless Bodyguard there to prevent the two life uh, attached to the card on Braska's Contempt by sacrificing it in response. Right, and another big thing for the control deck as well is having a whole bunch of card advantage. And finally, we see the second planes for Tice, but I don't know at this time, at this point in the game, it might be too little too late. I think uh, Andrew has all the answers he needs in his hand there. Yeah, Andrew has the, 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 the classic too many options <laughs> uh, available right now. As you can see, he has a Mortify in hand, he has a Removal yeah. Effect in hand, along with the Absorb, which can, again, help pad his life total and yes. Chemistry's Insight to cycle through one of the three Teferis that he has in his yeah, hand. Yeah, because, because he definitely can't play three Teferis. Right, Teferi here of Dominaria, legendary Planeswalker. You can only have one copy of those on the battlefield, so happy to cycle one of those away and try to find land number five to play out and that there Teferi. There we go. He got it, two lands off of the Chemist's Insight, as well as the Search for Escanta, another very powerful tool for the control player. Yeah, but I think what Andrew is going to be looking to do, instead of just slamming the Teferi this turn, given the fact that he drew Search for Escanta, he's going to choose to play Search for Escanta here while keeping up mana to cast either Mortify or Absorb yes. on this following turn. If Tice does manage to find another land, which and he, he does. does, it's either History of Benalia or the Benelish Marshal hitting the board. Right. What do you think is was preferable here? Is it is it better to get the history of Benalia? Ticket? Yeah, I, I think generally I prefer playing out the history of Benalia as it does present multiple threats. Yeah. Now, if he does play out the Benalish Marshal, then I can see Andrew looking to cast Mortify onto Marshall. If Tice chooses to play History of Benalia, however, I think Absorb is what you want to be doing because then it allows, the Absorb can cleanly deal with the multiple threats provided by the History of Benalia. Exactly that. The Absorb getting rid of History of Benalia. Tice can do nothing except resolve it. Goodbye, into the graveyard you go, and life total increases for Andrew. Yeah, search for Escanta. At this point, Andrew Allenbogen has to be very, very close to be uh, able to transform. There we go, that he is there. Escanta. And it is now Escanta the Sunken Ruin. So now, Andrew Allenbogen has access to six mana, can play to fairy, plus it, activate it, and still have the ability to cast the Mortify in his hand to deal with whatever threats Tice can deploy onto the battlefield. And look at this, more removal. Andrew firmly in the lead in this game. All right, so it's a fairy untapping two lands at the end step, allowing him basically to play anything that he wants out of his hand. Sky March Aspirant on the draw for Tice. Yeah, and that is the one issue when you do play the white aggressive deck. If you do not have that fast start and if you can't pressure your opponent's life total, yeah. because your deck is playing so many one mana creatures, you don't have the powerful top decks that a lot of these other slower control decks have. So have at this point, it is nearly impossible for Tice to actually get out of this, uh, get out of this situation. All right, and Andrew choosing to get rid of the Dauntless Bodyguard. Yeah, so nice he, sacrificing it in response. So you might be asking, hey, why did he use the Mortify on the one mana creature instead of the Knowledge Marshal? What Andrew wants to do is basically preserve the loyalty of Teferi as much as possible. Given that he has other removal spells in hand, by casting Mortify on the 2-1 this turn, he actually he effectively preserves a few loyalty points on the Teferi, and he can use the one of his either cast down or mortify on the Benalish Marshal on the following turn. Cast down, dismissing the Benalish Marshal from the board, so Snubhorn Sentry is left all alone again. Poor little guy. I will say though, having played Mono White quite um, you know, frequently, uh, I do feel like I lose steam after a while playing right. against a control match. Yeah, definitely. So, you need to get off to that fast start. Yeah. And again, flipping Legion's Landing is a very, very important part of trying to win this matchup. But, you know, Andrew basically has had all the answers and has just drawn a, a very, very smooth mm -hmm. sequence of cards in this specific matchup. Now, Andrew has the ability to Use Mortify to kill a creature, has Chemistry's Insight, and also has the ability to activate Ascanta the Sunken Ruin. So in situations like this, you know, you're looking at the board, Tice has a bunch of creatures on the battlefield, you're like, hey, why is Andrew so heavily favored? Well, he's got more mana, he's got more cards, and it's just basically a matter of time before this Esper control deck ultimately finds its win conditions to close out the game. So what would Andrew be digging for with Ascanta the Sunken Ruin? What's his, uh, what's the thing he wants to find next? I think, the thing that you feel the safest is making sure you find and absorb some kind of counter magic sure. in case you ha uh, your opponent finds something that can't actually deal with 
um, you know, the removal spells that you have in hand. So Absorb will be one of those things that uh, I can see Andrew looking for. And on top of that, ultimately, Andrew just wants to close out this game, right? Because at this point, he's going to be able to have answers to all of the threats that Tyus provides. Yeah. So now he wants to find that one copy of Kaya and slowly get to work on Tyus's graveyard and ultimately use Kaya's ultimate to be able to close out the game. So the venerated Loxodon, I didn't think we would see this hit the board, but... Andrew doesn't have any answers for this at the moment. Right, Andrew actually doesn't have removal in hand, but he does have a lot of ways to dig through his deck. He does have Ascanthor the Sunken Ruin along with the Chemist's Insight. And I think he's deciding what he wants to do. He chooses to go for the Chemist's Insight here. Still oh, no removal. interesting, and he found an Absorb there. there if he used the Chemist's Insight in response to the Loxodon, he would have actually been able to cast that Absorb mm -hmm. on the Venerated Loxodon. So now Andrew digging here for a Sweeper if possible. Oh, whoa, whoa, battle. look at that. <laughs> a Settle the Wreckage. So now Tice has to try to mm -hmm. play around to Settle the Wreckage. And, you know, it's one of those situations. Do you choose to attack with all your creatures? One of the advantages I... of attacking with all your creatures, you know you get Settle the Wreckage, right? Yes. You get Settle the Wreckage and you do have to dig a bunch of, dig, uh, get a bunch of lands and you lose all your creatures. However, you will have flipped that Ascanto the Sunken, uh, sorry, the, the Adanto, yes. rather. And that will allow Tice to put a threat on the battlefield every single turn. And that might be kind of his, his victory condition at this point. All right, so both creatures, I'm assuming, will go after Teferi. He is the biggest threat on the board here. Oh, and Swing it looks like there's attacks. only two creatures currently on the battlefield here. Yeah. And despite how Tyce chooses to attack here, Andrew is just going to be firing off this Settle the Wreckage. And Tyce has a board of all lands. Meanwhile, Andrew Ellenbogen here with an active Teferi. Active Ascanta the Sunken Ruin with Absorb in hand. And there it is. That's the win condition for this deck. It only plays one copy of Kaya as the primary way to close out games. So now he's going to be able to use this Kaya to gain life, exile Tysa's graveyard, and ultimately use her ultimate for, you know, 20 plus damage to seal the game. So Tyce is unfortunately empty-handed, sitting looking at the top of his deck each turn. No real way to draw cards for the white deck either. Yeah. Which uh, the control deck does exceptionally well at with the chemistry's insights. Right. So Teferi and keeps plussing, keeps digging through the deck, finding exactly what Andrew needs. And Tice sees the writing on the wall and concedes. Alright, so we're going to game two. Yeah. Congratulations to Andrew picking up the first win of the Mythic Invitational. We'll be going to the next round with the opposite decks. So. Right, absolutely. So you're going to be seeing here the other decks that the players have presented. So for Andrew Ellenbogen, his deck B is Gruel Warriors, which is basically, if you look at the mana base, it's effectively a mono red deck. It's got Goblin Chain Whirler, but at the same time, because of unclaimed territory, you can actually play some giant green monsters to accompany your your red creature. So as you can see here, you have Thorn Lieutenant, Gruel Spellbreaker, and Grow Chamber Guardian, all warriors. So you take advantage of the fact that unclaimed territory, you can name it Naming Warriors, which effectively acts as another land that produces both red and green mana. If you notice, you're not going to see a lot of green spells in this deck. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, the, the, the kind of primary reason to bring this deck over something like Mono Red is this deck goes, a it's a little bit bigger than the Mono Red deck, and it goes a little bit over the top mm -hmm. of those other strategies. The Unclaimed ter Territory also helping the Goblin Chain Whirler, make him, making him easier to cast. Absolutely. Well. You need a lot of red sources oh, to yeah. be able to cast that Goblin <laughs> Chain Whirler in turn. Looking at Tyson's deck, it is a Mono Red aggro, relying on the cheap one-drop spells, the removals in the shocks, the lightning strikes, the steamkin as well being almost an alternate source of mana for the deck because it's not running that many lands. Yeah, so what this mono red aggro deck is looking to do is, you know, play a couple of cheap creatures early, get in for some some damage here and there, and then ultimately end the game with a flurry of burn spells. So as you can see, you have four shocks, four lightning strikes, four wizards lightnings, and even three copies of skewer the critics to be able to just kind of burn your opponent out. On top of that, this deck actually has a little more staying power than the typical aggressive strategies because it's playing cards like Light Up the Stage and Experimental Frenzy, which actually provide you card advantage, which is something typically you don't see from an aggressive deck. All right, so the players are ready to kick off, taking a look at Tysa's opening hand here. Two mountains, get to Lava Run, a Lightning Strike, Skewer the Critics, and two Wizards Lightning. That's 
pretty good. It's a lot of burn spells. I would love to see, for example, a light up the stage or maybe another threat in hand. But, you know, it's the classic two lands, five spells hands yeah. out of your aggressive deck. I think you're probably going to have to keep this hand. And also, Tice is on the draw, so he can, you know, have additional draw steps to find more threats to put onto the battle. Let's take a look at Andrew's opening hand. A Mountain, Stomping Ground, Shock, Rule, Spellbreaker, Skargon, Hellcat, and Thorny Tenet. That's also... That's keepable. It's keepable, but it's close because you see those two copies of Skargon, Hellkite, and look, you see Andrew in agony here <laughs> about whether or not he wants to keep the sand. He's on the play. He yes. needs to put three lands together to be able to cast those Skargon, Hellkites, and if he doesn't find those lands in time, you know, they kind of look effectively like mulligans because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to play those in time. But I think Andrew, given the fact that he has a shock, which is cheap interaction yeah. for this matchup, along with Thorn Lieutenant for turn two, and then a Gruul spell Spellbreaker on turn three if he finds a land, yeah. he's just like, you know what, I'm going to keep this. If I yeah. don't draw a land, I'm likely going to be able to find spells that I can cast instead. He's risking it for the biscuit, and I think you got to take some risks here, that's for sure. So Thorn Lieutenant hits the board, and of course, whenever it is targeted it creates another 1-1 one, one elf creature which yeah. can be useful in a in a deck that likes to also just you know get rid of a yeah. whole bunch of stuff on your board absolutely Thor thorn lieutenant highly effective against these aggressive creature strategies that we expected. I think coming into the tournament, a lot of people expected a lot of mono red and a lot of mono white. Yeah. Thor, a lot of the deck, a lot of the creatures in the mono white deck are one mana two ones. So this just does an excellent job of blocking. And then against the red deck, if they use lightning strike to kill it, you still have a one one, which does allow you to, you know, provide an additional chump blocker. And if your opponent plays cards like Vyashino you know, Pyromancer, it also is good, does a good job of blocking those creatures as well. Tice opting to remove both creatures from the board and plusing, oh, sorry, uh, making the Gitu Lava Runner a 2 2 because of the spells in the graveyard there. And Andrew Ellenbogen saying, nope, get off my board, you're not staying. Yeah, and interesting, Andrew had the option of just casting a Gruul Spellbreaker there and playing it as a 4 4 as a blocker, but instead chose to use removal instead and keep up shock for another threat that Tice might play. And that's what, exactly what Andrew's gonna do here, using the shock on the Gitu Lava Runner and then playing a Spellbreaker. Mm -hmm. One big thing to note about Gruul Spellbreaker, or just four toughness creatures in general, mm. they match up very, very well against the cards in the mono red deck because the amount of damage that the mono red deck does is in increments of three. You have Wizard's Lightning, you have Skewer the Critics, and you have Lightning Strike. So no matter what, in order for your opponent to get this Gruul Spellbreaker off the board, they're going to have to commit two threats or two removal spells to be able to get this off the board. And exactly like you say, the Gruul Spellbreaker now and, and things Tice are can't remove it. Right, and this is really, really rough for Tice. He does have multiple removal spells, but he can't actually cast them to be able to get rid of this Gruul Spellbreaker because he can cast a Lightning Strike, but he doesn't have the mana for the Skewer of the Critics or the Wizard's Lightning, and he probably drew the worst draw in his deck in Experimental Frenzy, which is a four-mana card. He's only got two lands on the battlefield. Am I correct in saying that is the most expensive card in Tice's deck? Yes, absolutely. Experimental Frenzy, extremely powerful card, however, you do need to find the lands to play it. And now Andrew in the 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 premium spot here. You know, this is a spot I love being in when I play <laughs> when I play when I'm playing Magic. It's if I if I draw a land, great. If I don't draw a land, great. <laughs> right? Because he's got four lands on the battlefield. If he finds land number five, he can put that Skargan Hellkite onto the battlefield. But if he doesn't, he's just drawing more spells. So excellent, excellent spot for Andrew. Meanwhile, Tyson a lot of trouble here. Finds light up the stage, you can see the spectacle cards in hand, but he doesn't have a way to deal damage to Andrew and also play those spectacle cards in the same turn. He needs to find another land. It's do or die now for Hey, Tyson, look, great. I drew a spell. <laughs> right? I drew a spell. <laughs> so, cruel spellbreaker just swinging in, booping that snoot as often as it can. No way for uh, Tice to remove it at the moment, and Andrew is going to take full advantage of it. Thorn Lieutenant now hitting the board as well. Yeah, and a really good metagame call here from Andrew Ellenbogen, opting to go with Thorn Lieutenant for the two-mana green warrior of choice instead of the more traditional Crawl Harpooner. Mm. Now, if you're expecting a field where there's not going to be a lot of flying creatures in the format and you expect more mono red and mono white, which I think is kind of the correct assumption, yeah. then Thorn Lieutenant is actually a superior option to something like a Crawl Harpooner. Definitely. So finally, Tice finds his third mountain, and he is able to lightning strike Andrew in the face to enable the light up the stage to potentially find another mana source for them? Yeah, I believe that's an option, but Andrew's creatures are just outracing these burn spells at this point. I don't think Tice has a, a combination of draws here that can really get him out of this. Keep in mind, Andrew also, with two Skargan Hellkites in, in hand, oh, if yeah. he finds lands, he's just going to be playing five mana, four, four, flying hasty dragons. That's only slightly and terrifying. And Tice is sitting at 12 life here, and there's <laughs> land number five. All right. 
Andrew is in the driver's seat. I think he's quite safe to, you know, potentially pay the two life for the stomping ground. Oh, look, look at this. A Andrew realizing, he's thinking, what is the... At this point, he's so far ahead, he's yeah. thinking to himself, what is the way that I can lose this game? How can it possibly mm. lose? And it involves some strange combination of his opponents going shock into triple skewer the critics or something like that. Something so he ridiculous. didn't want to go down to 10 life and play the stomping ground mm. tap. Sure. Instead, opts to attack with the creatures, keep up lightning strike for a creature that Tice might play, and then play Skargan and Hellkite next turn. Because no matter how he kind of sequences, sequences his plays, he's going to have lethal next turn. Definitely. Um, so, we have seen that a few times when the Mono Red deck just goes absolutely bonkers right. with a combination of Experimental Frenzy, finding the Sharks, getting the Steamkins out, using their mana to play more things. We have seen that. We have seen a Red deck play by themselves, essentially, and just obliterate the opponent's life total, but I don't think we're going to get to see that today. Yeah, Tice with a much slower start here with a lot of burn spells um, that are conditionally cheap. If you have a wizard, wizard's lightning's cheap. Oh, yeah. If you're able to deal damage, skewer to critics is cheap. If you can't do either, there are over-costed burn spells, and that's basically the situation that the Tice has been in the entire game. And by the way, look at how close Tice got to actually closing out this game. If Andrew Ellenbogen went down to 10 life here, mm -hmm. he's got shock your face, skewer the critics your face, skewer the critics your face. Oh. That would have put Andrew Ellenbogen down to two. So oh. if Tice top decked another shock, that would have been that would have been it. That would have been the game. Been that is just exactly how swingy this red deck can be. He, he, at this point, Tyce is just going, you know what? I, I just want to show you how close to dead you were. Yeah, I think I, I think I would probably you, do that. You as gotta well. send a message before you go out, right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But keep in mind, of course, this is a double elimination tournament. So Tice, despite losing this first round, will still be very much live in this tournament. But we'll have to string together four consecutive wins to be able to make it into That's that That's why this first round is so important. Absolutely. Because uh, you'll, if, you, if you don't advance in the first round, you're going to be playing the most magic out of anyone in your group today. Right. Lightning strike and a go to the face here. Tice going down to three. And, oh, here uh, it comes. There it is. Terrifying Big Skargan dragon. Spark. There it goes. <laughs> and that'll do it for Andrew advancing to the next round. Congratulations to him. Tice now fights for his life in the lower bracket. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it was it was just one of those games where sometimes, you know, Tice, especially if you if you think about what happened in that first game, it's one of those things where you have a white deck. You have a deck with a ton of one-mana creatures, so even if you don't find lands, you can still put pressure on the battlefield. But one of the strengths of these aggressive decks is the fact that you can put multiple threats on the battlefield in the same turn. So that was a really close decision, and ultimately it just didn't end up paying off for him because he was kind of stuck on one land. And if you saw in the, in the second game, stuck on two lands, so he just really couldn't muster up enough pressure to be able to deal with Andrew Ellenberg. That is the risk with the aggressive decks. They don't draw cards as well as the control decks for example right. so they are going to be struggling for mana if you get a little unlucky you, your game can your game plan could just be stalled entirely so yeah absolutely you're gonna need to sometimes just keep one land hands and hope it ends up going well because yeah. if you go down to six if you go down to five sometimes you're just not gonna ha have enough punch to be able to deal the full 20 points of damage to kill your opponent all right we are ready to fling it over to becca who's got Al andrew ellenberg in front of you we are back here in the other feature match area where we have Wyatt Darby versus Jerry Thompson. Now, let's take a look at their decks quickly, Paul. We see a Rakdos Midrange versus Esper Control. Rakdos Midrange being the only one in the deck submissions. Yeah, so this is a, a deck that Jerry's actually had success with in other formats in the past. Just a deck that has a lot of good removal spells, kind of a, more of a mid-range deck actually. It's some, something that you don't, you won't see a lot coming into this tournament, but this is a true mid-range deck. It has a lot of removal spells, and then it, it, it plays a bunch of creatures as well, but all the creatures provide value. Uh, basically, you know, you have cards like the Rick's Mighty Reveler, you have cards like Rekindling Phoenix, and all those cards, you need to be able to use multiple cards to deal with the threat. And even if you use a card to deal with it, a lot of the times the creatures will have provided at least a card's worth of value. Mm -hmm. The other card that I quite like in this Rakdos midrange list is Angrath of Flame Chain, which I think is it's pretty good against a lot of these uh, mono, uh, mono white, mono red decks with a lot of the cheap creatures that they can just steal and then get rid of. Yeah, Angrath of Flame Chain is kind of their, their uh, kind of 
cheap version of Teferi Hero of Dominari, I want to say. <laughs> you know, you have a 5-mana Planeswalker that basically kind of gets you card advantage over time. And then, you know, it's got a, a couple of other... It's got a little more utility with the minus effect. Certainly weaker than Teferi, but if you're playing the Rakdos colors, this is kind of your your card advantage engine of choice, I, I suppose. And here we see a look at Wyatt Darby's Esper Control List, which uh, he's currently rocking. Anything sleeping out here? Anything out of the ordinary no, when it comes to looks, Esper? No, this looks nearly identical to Andrew Ellen, Ellenbogen's Esper Control deck. Again, the most important cards here being Kaya's Wrath. Uh, you want to be able to use sweepers to control the board and then take over the game with Teferi Hero of Dominaria. And again, you see the one copy of Kaya Orzhov Usurper as kind of the primary win condition of the deck. I have noticed she she pitches up whenever you need her. It's like, oh, right. I, I need my Kaya there. Yeah, and, and like she just <laughs> gives you so much utility. She gives you uh, a, a source of life gain. She's also good at killing, of course, one drop, one mana creatures and ultimately ending the game because, you know, you can win the game with Teferi yes. by continuing to take it up over time, using the emblem, making your opponents have zero permanent and then eventually decking your opponent, but Kaya just kind of expedites the process. And here we see Jerry Thompson's Rectors mid-range, the only one amongst all the deck lists submitted. And as you can see here, Dire Fleet Daredevil gets you a card. Rick's Mighty Reveler can get you cards. Rekindling Phoenix, you gotta kill it twice. And then even the Legion <laughs> Warboss, if you don't have a removal spell for it immediately, it will give you that Goblin. So it does put some pressure early, but of course it also has multiple ways to get get card advantage. This deck is chock full of two for ones. Oh, yeah. Look at treasure map. You play treasure map early, uh, at some point you're going to be able to flip it, cash those treasures in for cards. You have Carnival Carnage. Excellent, excellent card I believe in this field because okay. Carnival is super, super relevant in this field where the aggressive decks of choice have a ton of one mana creatures. So it's a one mana effect to kill a bunch of creatures, but it's not a dead card in control matchups either oh. because you can use the Carnage side where you can make your opponents discard two cards and also have them take three damage. Let's take a look here. We can see the uh, Rekindling Phoenix egg on the board. So a birdie just went down. Yeah, but this looks firmly in Wyatt Darby's favor. Jerry Thompson only with four lands. Ooh. Look at how many lands look Wyatt has in lands. play. What, what, what happened? I mean, if, <laughs> if you think about, if you think about just kind of what happened throughout the course of this game, Wyatt's gotta be up like, Millions of cards, <laughs> right? Look at this. He's got more lands in play. He's got more cards in hand. He's even got an Ascanta the Sunken Ruin in play, a Surge for Ascanta in play, and a Chemist's Insight in the graveyard. All right, Jerry going for the Carnage, making Wyatt Darby discard two cards from hand. Yeah. He doesn't have the fifth mana source in hand there. But, uh, right. He's, and, and this definitely feels like a game where Wyatt is just looking for Teferi or Kaya to just ultimately close out this game. Yeah. Oh, and there's a Teferi emblem. That's why Jerry has no lands right. to play. Right. Teferi emblem, as you can see there, anytime you draw a card, you get to oh, exile no. a permanent that your opponents have on the battlefield. So, Teferi emblem in play. Pretty soon, Jerry is going to have no permanents on the battlefield here. And it looks oh, like a Wyatt is almost decked out. He, no, he, Wyatt has no cards left no in library. Cards. The <laughs> only card he has in library <laughs> is Teferi Hero of Dominaria. So you see the alternate win condition. This is why the Esper Control deck doesn't play a lot of other win conditions, because this is what you can do. You tick up Teferi, you get the emblem, you make it so that your opponent has no permanence on the battlefield, and then eventually you will deck your opponent. <laughs> And that is, that is the strategy. That's what you're seeing here. Wyatt Darby, again, every turn, he gets a draw step. He gets that draw step, exiles another permanent. His hand does have two, uh, three removal spells along with that absorb. So uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for Jerry to, uh, to kind of come back from this. This does look like a situation to be in. I, 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 I usually, by this point, I'm just like, all right, fine. You have it, but with one million dollars worth of prize money on the line, right? That's not going to happen. That's Absolutely. Not happen. And as you can see, there's an there's an innocuous O1 token on the battlefield, <laughs> and you might be wondering what's going on. Yeah. Why why is this token not turning into a rekindling phoenix? Well, rekindling phoenix needs to be in your graveyard yes. for you to actually get that phoenix. So I imagine that a Kaya was used at some point to exile the Rekindling Phoenix in uh, Jerry Thompson's in graveyard. Right, so or it could have just been exiled with Teferium. What is the win condition here for either player? Again, the win condition for Wyatt is running Jerry out of permanence. He just all wants right. to get rid of all of the lands, okay. and then ultimately he's going to end up being able to deck Jerry Thompson. Okay. All right. So Jerry, just holding on of to this course, lightning strike, just to send a this message is a, home later This on. is a secondary way to win in Magic. If your opponent runs out of cards in their library during their draw step, you will lose the game. So, 
Wyatt, however, cannot lose the game because he does have that Teferi, and Teferi, which has the ability to go minus three, put target non-land permanent, in, in, uh, into its owner's library. And so he just basically kind of, kind of the, 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 the way people talk about it is you use the fairy to tuck itself. Yes. You, you use it to fairy, target itself, and put it back into your library so you can't actually death. Unless Jerry finds a way to kill the Teferi. But, but Wyatt also has yeah. the Absorb. I have noticed, though, that Wyatt has been removing all the red sources, which, of course, power all the burn spells that could possibly kill Teferi. Right. Uh, which, yeah, this is, a, this is a bit of a situation to be in. You don't often see this play out at all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, no. Yes, this, this, is, this, is, this is actually really interesting. But unfortunately, Jerry might have drawn this too little too late. He has a Carnival Carnage and a Lightning Strike. Mm. So th that would have been multiple ways to deal with Teferi in response to the minus, of, minus effect because Teferi would go down to one. Unfortunately, however, no red mana sources. However, though. no red mana sources. So White will just keep sucking himself, making sure that Teferi is always cycling through. And uh, Jerry can only just keep playing lands and unfortunately have them blown up by the Teferi emblem. Yeah, and you will know, I mean, keep in mind, Jerry not conceding here. Again, this is a tournament where first place, $250,000. It ain't over till it's over. Yep. And uh, Jerry continuing to fight the fight here. You will notice as well, friends, that there are a bunch of new card styles. Uh, there are deck sleeves. Uh, now in the game. And oh, and Jerry going uh, for the carnival here in response, oh. but Wyatt does have the absorb. But Jerry's still not out of it. If he finds a red source, he can use lightning strike to get that Teferi off the battlefield, but he needs to find it within the next two turns. He actually needs to find it next turn. <laughs> yeah, because that other land is going away now. So this other land's going to go away. Actually, no. I think this might actually seal it. Because even if Jerry finds a red source, he's going to lose one of it's his lands prior yeah. to Teferi com coming into the battlefield. So he won't have access to the two mana to cast Lightning Strike to t try and remove that Teferi. And at this point, the game is yeah. locked up. I think that's it for Jerry, unfortunately. Wyatt taking the win there. Congratulations to him. And, uh, yeah... That was game one. Well, you saw how grindy that game looked, yeah. so it is not that surprising, especially because what we saw in the previous uh, the previous match was just a bunch, what was you know aggressive decks just kind of folding, uh, and the games didn't sure, go yeah, especially yeah. long. But yeah, that is the power of the Esper control deck. That game, you know, but both players just exchanging resources back and forth. But simply put, I mean, Jerry's deck has a lot of ways to get two for ones, but the Esper control deck has you know, many more ways to get ahead on cards. You have Escanta the Sunken Ruin, which a black-red deck just has no good way to deal with enchantments. So once that card flips, you are going to just fall so far behind in the matchup. All right, so in the next game, we should be seeing green-red aggro versus mono-red aggro. So uh, yeah, this, this game should, in theory, go a little bit quicker. Right. And th this is this is different than what we saw from Andrew Ellenbogen, where that was a primarily mono red deck, yes. splashing green for some warriors. This is a mono green deck. It's it's what we call a stompy deck. Use just yes. the biggest, baddest green creatures in the format with the light splash of red for Collision Colossus. Collision Colossus, of course, being the split card where you can either deal six damage to a flyer or give a creature plus four plus two and trample. And uh, with these big guys hitting the board, I think either or would be pretty good. Right, but if you take a look at Wyatt Darby's hand, lots of three drops in hand, but misses land drop number three. Mm -hmm. So th this is a huge, huge start from Jerry. And I don't think why it's going to be really hard for Wyatt to come back from this. Look at this curve. Turn oh, one Pell Collector into Thorn Lieutenant into Steel Leaf Champion. Steel Leaf Champion currently cannot be blocked until Goblin Chain Runner hits the board, buffing up the Runaway Steamkin number one. Yeah, so, so there is a Chain Whirler in play, which does a really good job of keeping the Thorn Lieutenant back. And uh, and also the Pelt Collector, unless Jerry has an additional way to pump the Pelt Collector. But take a look at Jerry's hand. Look at the monsters 
the giant <laughs> monsters he's in. He can go, look at that, Galta. He can play a Galta for two mana right Galta now. is mm -hmm. a 12-12 Trampler. <laughs> so he's going to go Pell Collector into Galta Primal Hunger here. Ooh, and there is just no way that Wyatt could come back from this board. Look at this. He's got Holy over 20 goodness. power on the battlefield here. That is insane. Choosing just to go with the Steel Leaf Champion here, holding back the Pelt Collector to do some good blocking if necessary. Because uh, even though you have the advantage, you never know what the red deck might pull out of their sleeves. So. Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, th this is the true power of kind of the, the mono green, splash red, stompy deck. You just have the biggest creatures, and they simply will outclass the creatures of any other cre uh, creature deck. I mean, Jerry just curved out insanely well. Right. Now, Wyatt will be able to put some threats, put some nice threats on the battlefield here because he does have two copies of Runaway Steamkin in play, which gets counters and then you can cash in those counters for mana. So he can kind of maybe chain together a bunch of spells. But at the end of the day, it's still going to take a lot to be able to fight through that Galta that's on the battlefield. Not only that, Jerry is holding a Collision Colossus in hand, which can allow him to kind of get in for the final few points of damage with one of his other creatures. Exactly that. Mono Red, not known for running the biggest creatures. And when you've got a 12 tile flying at your face, yeah, you're going to have a bit of a bad time. So let's see what happens when we pass back to Jerry's turn. So Wyatt will be able to effectively empty out his hand. He's got five mana in the mana pool. Starting with a Risk Factor and Jerry deciding what to do with the Risk Factor. Will he take the four damage here? Or will he allow Wyatt Darby to draw? What do you think is the best? Cards? What's the best? I think I would I lean towards it. taking the damage here, but there is a small chance that... Well, actually, no. I, yeah, I would I would probably look to take the damage here. It's dangerous giving the red deck cards. It's also right. dangerous with, taking damage. <laughs> with the two Stinkins in play, you draw three cards. What if you draw three Skewer the Critics, right? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of scary scenarios there, so Jerry just instead opting here to just starve Wyatt of red spells to be able to kind of continue going off with the Runaway Steamkin. Now, when uh, the Fanatical Firebrand hits the board, he is able to empty the first Steamkin to play yet another Goblin Chain Whirler or the Risk Factor if he decides to Yeah, and the this is the true power, though. When you play against a deck with not a lot of removal and Runaway Steamkin goes unchecked, it can do some really powerful things. Because aside from Collision Colossus, I don't think there's actually any removal cards in this green-red deck. It's mostly well, just, I have bigger guys than you. What? <laughs> your removal is just your giant creatures, yeah. right? Why, why, why play removal when you can yeah. just play three mana five fours? <laughs> right? Exactly that. So here we go, another risk factor. I think Jerry's going to take the damage again because White only has one other card in hand. <laughs> this is going to take him down to five life, but the oh. red deck doesn't play a five damage spell. No, it so doesn't. So I, I think... <laughs> Jerry choosing to play this wisely and, you know, uh, very close to a lethal attack on but the following turn. But he can empty he might just the other runaway attack. steam pin and then get the Goblin Chain Roller to hit. No, there's nothing he can do four damage with, right? Right. However, well, he can use a Fanatical Firebrand, though. Exactly. So he so can he use... He go down to three. He can use the... He, by ju just by casting the Chain Roller, he'll be able to get the Pell Collector on the left off the battlefield. Yeah. And then he can use the Firebrand to get the Thorn Lieutenant off the battlefield. And, but look, he's looking to fire off the Firebrand first on the Thor Lieutenant here, get that token, and then play the Chain Whirler, right. which will then cleanly clean up the token and the Thor Lieutenant. Very nice play, getting rid of three creatures in one fell swoop. Bye bye. But again, Galta. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I gotta say, just Galta. What well, are you gonna do? Well, you can block the Galta, but uh, you, know, yeah. you have two other pretty big guys there to deal with as well, so. Exactly. <laughs> still a bit of a tricky situation to be you, in. You, you have Galta, and Pell Collector currently has three counters on it as well. So the mm -hmm. Pell Collector has Trample. Yes. The Steel Leaf Champion is hard to block. Yep. And there's a Galta in play. And on top of that, Jerry has a Collision Colossus, which can completely mess up math. Oh, yeah. At this point, Jerry just making sure you run the numbers, or he might just attack just with everything. Just go sideways yeah. and, Easy game. You know. This Math is for blockers, as yeah. we've heard. I, so I, 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 I love, the, I love the, the, <laughs> the strategy of, you know what, when in doubt, just attack with everything, yeah. and uh, things will probably go well, yeah. especially with that combat trick in Jerry Thompson's hand. That. So uh, possibly going on the Steel Leaf or just adding some more extra oomph to Galta. Yeah, so as you can see right now, there's two Runaway Steamkins, or a Steamkin and a Chain Whirler on the Galta, but however he blocks, Jerry will be able to use that Collision Colossus for lethal. Bit of a tricky with Trump. For yeah. Him to be in. <laughs> yeah uh, you can see the block has been like uh, maybe like, it's like this. I have like no this. good blocks. What do I do? <laughs> Please. Get bigger chain whirlers. Nope. Yeah. Nope. 
have a dinosaur. Two mana for a 12 12 trampler. Is that, is that a oh. good rate? Yeah, I, I would, know. you know, I'm, I'm not reasonable. an expert, but uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> oh, and here we now have. So we have a we have a double block. So so, assuming Jerry has nothing, this would get wide down to one. However, Jerry of course has Colossus here. Plus four, plus two trample for a lethal attack, and we're going to game three. First game three of the Mythic Championship, and Galta swinging in for lethal. What a good dinosaur he is. Right. What a good dinosaur. Wow, and, that is and, painful. And now we're gonna have. That interesting situation. We are now, we have our first game three. We're gonna be in a situation where now both players have the option to choose deck A or deck B yeah, because, for that final game. Because rounds one and two are, well, round one is essentially random. Then you pick the opposite deck that two watch you played. And right. then round three, you have a choice now. So if you are Wyatt and Jerry, what are you picking here? What is what is your preferred or your preferred deck to go? Yeah, so so now we're we're in a really interesting spot because we saw that Rakdos mid range deck kind of get out grinded by the Esper control deck. So in that specific matchup, I would I would say that the Esper control deck's probably slightly favored. However, but we have to consider time as well. Yes, time is also an option, and I mean that that green aggro deck just looked really impressive. And yeah. and if I'm on Jerry's side. Given what happened in that other game, I think the, the green aggro deck is probably a pretty strong choice uh, against the decks that are presented here because the, the, the mono green deck, sometimes it does struggle against the white aggressive decks, but I think it does a really good job of fighting the mono red deck. So let's see what happens here. All right, and we have gone for the aggro deck in both player situations. So Fanatical Firebrand hitting the board first, swinging in for one point of damage. And here we should see a Growth Chamber Guardian, which Wyatt Darby will want to dismiss of quite quickly. Yeah, but this is an ideal start for uh, Jerry Thompson here. He's got double Steely oh. Champion into Galta. And we talked oh about it goodness. before, the Mono Red deck needs to use multiple resources to get four toughness creatures off the battlefield because all the burn spells that it plays goes to the face. It direct damage spells, and all the direct damage spells in the format that people play deal three damage. There's, there is a card in Lava Coil that people could consider, but in a best of one environment, that is not the type of removal spell in a mono red aggressive deck really wants to put into their decks. Not at all. So if the Steel Leaf Champion sits, we'll see the next Steel Leaf Champion, and then we'll see a Galta Primal Hunger the turn thereafter. All right, so Wyatt, Putting the pressure though, using Firebrand plus Wizard's Lightning here to clear the way for the Gitu Lava Runner. Ooh, but in a second copy of Galta, not great for Jerry Thompson, but there is another 5-4. And at this point, Jerry does probably not want to block. I think Wyatt might need to just present the trade here. Just go, hey, look, I'm gonna attack here because I cannot beat you if you play a Galta. So <laughs> if you wanna block, I will use two two cards to be able to get that Steel Leaf Champion off the battlefield. Do you think Jerry takes the block here? Oh, I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure. He might just want to take it here. Ooh, okay. So now, Wyatt Darby using Lightning Strike, going to the face, making the Runaway Steamkin into a 4-4, and actually Jerry in trouble here. Yeah. He cannot play those Galtas because the base cost on Galta is 12 mana, and the way you cast Galta is by using the cost reduction effects of your gigantic green creatures. So perhaps Jerry shouldn't have blocked there, but, you know, there's no way to know, but it is Absolutely. a burn deck that, you know, they would probably have some burn spells up their sleeves. Yeah, at this point, what Jerry needs to do is, of course, find large creatures. Yes. And also hope to hope that Wyatt doesn't string together a bunch of burn spells mm -hmm. in a row because, you know, Wyatt drew a land this turn and he has five lands in play. He just needs to preserve his life total as best as possible. And luckily for him, he can adapt straight away to go and find a second creature and refill yeah. his hand until such time as, you know, Set up his defenses all right, and then he can go on the offensive again. Yeah, that was a huge draw for Jerry, and Wyatt actually doesn't even have an attack anymore. That Grow Chamber Guardian was fantastic for Jerry. Jerry now is guaranteed to have relevant threats for basically the rest of the game, or the rest of this game. Yeah. And the, the way Wyatt primarily wins this matchup now is by stringing together three three damage burn spells in a row, because now creatures, creature combat is not really going to be his way to try to win this game. All right. The game has gone to time, and Wyatt Darby walks off with a victory. Oh, wow. Wow, okay. And that is a result of that first game that taking first so game long. That first game took so long. That's, took, that's took the a risk time. bringing a control, a control deck to what you would imagine to be a quite a control-heavy tournament. Right. 
And of course, we have rules in place. Once, once it goes to time, the winner of the match is the person who has the higher life. And at that point, Wyatt Darby was able to get in, get in aggressive. I actually thought that Esper Control might have been a better deck to play. But, of course, with time running out, that's not the deck that you want to be playing. You want to be playing the Mono Red deck. And I think that's a consideration that some players even make coming into this tournament, going, if I'm going to be submitting an Esper Control deck, the other deck should probably be an aggressive deck. Yeah. Red is probably the best option because even in the situations where you're behind on board, you might be able to still get that win by just casting a bunch of burn yeah. spells and being ahead on life total once time's called. Yeah, it's very risky bringing two control decks to the tournament, I think, because you, you, you can't afford to go that slowly, unfortunately. Absolutely. We're sending it over to Beckon now for an interview with Wyatt Darby, so stay tuned.